In today's video, we bring Screw Tape to explain his letters with his usual sarcasm. By the end of this video, you'll discover the smallest but most cunning traps that lead us away from Christ. The long, tedious, and monotonous years of middle-aged prosperity or middle-aged adversity are an excellent climate for campaigns. You see, it is so hard for these creatures to persevere. The routine of adversity, the gradual decay of youthful loves and youthful hopes, the silent despair, barely felt as pain, of ever overcoming the chronic temptations with which we repeatedly defeat them, the monotony we create in their lives, and the inarticulate resentment with which we teach them to respond to it. All this provides admirable opportunities to wear down a soul by attrition. Ah, the monotony of middle age. What a wonderful climate for our campaign. These poor creatures, always trying to persevere, but we know how hard it is for them. The constant routine of adversity, the slow death of youthful loves and hopes, and that silent despair barely felt as pain. It's like a comedy show where they repeatedly fall for the same jokes, and the monotony we carefully create in their lives, perfect. They don't even realize how consumed they are by resentment. Yes, it's the perfect recipe for wearing down a soul, slowly, without haste. And the best part? They don't even notice what's happening. What a masterpiece of subtle manipulation. Do you see how easy it is for them? Do you know why? Because it is hard for us to overcome and move forward. In Galatians chapter 6, verse 9, it says, Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. We need to understand the root of the problem, where our longings come from, our sorrows, and also all this pent-up resentment. Working on this can be a huge challenge, but with God, nothing is impossible. I believe in us believers, because by choosing Christianity, we already knew about the challenges, and only people with great spirits choose a path as rewarding and at the same time as difficult as the path of Christ. Make sure they are always very spiritual, always looking for some inner experience they hope God will give them. Teach them to value each prayer based on its success in producing the desired feeling, and never let them suspect how much they depend on themselves for success. This sort of thing can be managed. It distracts the man's attention from God to himself. Ah, uh, the subtle art of keeping souls so preoccupied with spirituality that they barely have time to notice the reality of their own existence. This text, my dear friends, is a gem of celestial manipulation. Teach them to incessantly seek a divine experience, one they believe can only come from an external source, never from within. And when they pray, make sure they judge the value of their words, not by sincerity or content, but by how intensely they feel touched afterward. It's a spectacle to see how they strive to feel something that confirms they are on the right path. If you don't realize how wrong it is to seek only a spiritual experience, you'll end up in an endless cycle, searching for something only outside yourself and not from within. In Luke chapter 18, verses 11 to 14, it says, The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Our entire spiritual journey begins with us. You cannot rely solely on spiritual signs. Changes in our character and conduct are the beginning of the spiritual path. But above all, be humble, because that will bring you closer to God. Lewis argues about this in Mere Christianity. It is not enough to want to be good, as if we could be good just by wanting. We must learn to be good, practice goodness, just as we practice any other skill. We must seek God's help, for without Him we can do nothing, but we must also act. 
With each choice we make, we are becoming either a heavenly creature or a hellish creature. We are taking the form of a horror or a glorious wonder. Thus, we can understand the importance of our attitudes and conduct before God. You will say that these are very small sins, and no doubt, like all young tempters, you are eager to report spectacular wickedness. But remember, the only thing that matters is the degree to which you separate the man from the enemy. It does not matter how small the sins are, as long as their cumulative effect is to edge the man away from the light and out into the nothing. Murder is no better than playing cards if playing cards can do the trick. Indeed, the safest road to hell is the gradual one, the gentle slope, soft underfoot, without sudden turnings, without milestones, without signposts. Did you really think that only devastatingly evil deeds could lead you to hell? The true art lies in the small sins. Don't worry about great crimes. Just lead someone away from the light, one step at a time. The accumulation of small errors is more effective than any grand sin. After all, who needs murders when a card game can lead to the same end? Hell is not an abrupt fall, but a gentle descent, without obstacles, milestones, or warnings. It's a sneaky path, where every little slip counts. Who would have thought that the road to perdition would be so comfortable? In Song of Solomon, chapter 2, verse 15, it says, Catch for us the foxes, the little foxes that ruin the vineyards, our vineyards that are in bloom. As you can see, the Bible also speaks of how small things on a large scale can ruin good things. Being good or evil depends only on the actions of people. Small kindnesses done repeatedly also make a great impact, just as small evils do. It is necessary to pay attention to your attitudes before the Lord. For nothing is hidden from Him, and the reckoning will come. It is no use disguising your small sins. No one leaves this life without paying for them. It is far better to make them live in the future. Biological necessity makes all their passions point in that direction, so that thought about the future inflames hope and fear. Moreover, it is unknown to them, so making them think about it means we make them think of unrealities. In a word, the future is, of all things, the least like eternity. It is the most completely temporal part of time, for the past is frozen and no longer flows, and the present is all lit up with eternal rays. Hence the encouragement we have given to all those schemes of thought, such as creative evolution, scientific humanism, or communism, which fix men's affections on the future, on the very core of temporality. Ah, the trick of the future. How brilliant it is to make these poor creatures fixate on the future. Biology already pushes them in that direction, inflaming hopes and fears. And what better way to distract them from the eternal, illuminated present? The future is so uncertain and full of unrealities. Making them worry about what they do not know is perfect. That's why we encourage ideas like creative evolution, scientific humanism, and communism. All of them bind humans to the future, away from the now, and keep them focused on the most temporal part of time. When we focus only on the future, we forget an important detail. It will only exist if our present is fulfilled. By thinking too much about what may or may not happen, we forget that we have the power to govern our own destiny by making the right choices. In Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7, it says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. By surrendering your heart to God, you can achieve eternal life. It all starts here and now with our attitudes, our desires, our efforts, and our dedication. If all this is directed towards Jesus Christ, we can shape the future so that it is filled with blessings. The game is to have everyone running around with fire extinguishers whenever there is a flood, and everyone crowding to that side of the boat which has already nearly gone under. In this way, we make the present the least like eternity, 
for the present is the point at which time touches eternity. Ah, the art of distraction. Our game is simple. Make everyone act completely irrationally. Have them run with fire extinguishers during a flood, or crowd onto the side of the boat that is sinking. All this to ensure they never live the present as they should. We keep the present chaotic and disconnected from eternity, because the present is where time touches eternity. And if they truly lived in the present, they might realize this. So we maintain chaos and confusion, constantly diverting them from the present moment. It's a brilliant strategy, isn't it? Screwtape is always so proud of his work. Well, it's no surprise that distractions can lead us away from our goals. Even more dangerous is when we let them distance us from God. As we mentioned before, it is in the present that we create our destiny. And if we let ourselves be distracted from our path with Christ, we might never find our way back. According to Matthew chapter 6, verse 34, Therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. We must remain calm in all circumstances. Evil never sleeps, so do not get distracted. The trouble with argument is that it moves the whole struggle onto the enemy's own ground. He can argue too, whereas in really practical propaganda of the kind I am suggesting, he has been shown for centuries to be greatly at a disadvantage. Ah, logical arguments, what a waste of time. Arguing moves the battle onto the enemy's ground, where he can also play well. But practical propaganda, the subtle manipulation of minds, are in that he is clearly at a disadvantage. We maintain the upper hand by avoiding debates and focusing on propaganda, where we can distort reality at will. After all, why fight on equal ground when we can win without giving him a chance? It's a brilliant move, isn't it? In Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, it says, Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate, and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. After knowing God, I realize that not everything that appears to be true is genuine. We know very well that Satan is the master of manipulation, and his purpose is far from good. Let's remember one of the letters where Screwtape says, The safest road to hell is the gradual one, the gentle slope, soft underfoot, without sudden turnings, without milestones, without signposts. When we are enchanted by beautiful promises, whatever they may be, without any logic of deserving or effort to achieve them, that is one of the propaganda for perdition. This is one of the reasons the Christian path is so turbulent. But isn't it great that God is on our side, brothers and sisters? Do you know why the enemy wants to avoid a discussion with us? Because outside of his dirty game of manipulation, he has no power. If we have God in our hearts, no matter the moment in life, they will face an impenetrable wall. If we recognize the enemy's traps before he tries to enter our minds, they will never prosper. Your patient has become humble. Have you drawn his attention to that fact? All virtues are less formidable to us once the man is aware that he has them. But this is especially true of humility. Ah, humility. Such a difficult virtue to combat. But see, the trick is to make the patient proud of his humility. As soon as he realizes he is humble, we've ruined everything. Any virtue loses its value when a man boasts of it. But humility is especially vulnerable to this. Nothing like the perception of one's own progress to turn a formidable virtue into a new form of pride. See how we turn the table in our favor. In Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 and 2, it says, Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets, to be honored by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. Your actions can be the most commendable in the world, but when you do them only to show off to others and be recognized as virtuous and humble, the Bible and screw tape both tell us 
that this generates a new kind of pride. It can be considered one of the most powerful, subtle traps to lead us away from Christ. I truly hope you enjoyed this video. We brought each of these excerpts from the book as examples of traps that are difficult to detect and showed how the Bible also offers insights to understand that C.S. Lewis was a truly virtuous man who left us with much wisdom through his own understanding. Thank you for watching and see you next time.